Welcome back, Craftlings, to the Minecraft Short Stories Podcast. This is a momentous episode, because I have written a story. And this is not just any story. It is part two of The Loyalty in the Rapids. A story I wrote and published a few episodes ago. And this is a long story, so you guys are going to have to buckle in. I'm sure you guys saw the length of this episode before you clicked on it. I didn't release the week or the week before last because I had a really bad cold and no one wants to hear me try to read with a very stuffy nose and sore throat. It's worth it, I hope, for all the extra time I had to write the story. Anyways, the story was not submitted through my website, but if you would like to submit a story through my website, which is minecraftshortstories.com, no spaces, no capitals, then just go there. Go to submit a story page and fill out the form. It may get read on the podcast. While you're there, there's also some other stuff on the site. You can join the mailing list there, and then there's merch on there, if you guys didn't know that. Anyway, there's also a YouTube channel. Make sure to subscribe to that. This is all just formalities. I have to say this in the beginning of every episode. But let us get right into the story. The Loyalty in the Rapids, Part 2 After all Jason's troubles, he thought the Trident would be more interesting. Not to say that Jason didn't find it glorious to be able to hold such a weapon in his hand, but it seemed the same as all the other descriptions of Trident he had heard or read about. Except for the fact that it was glowing softly with enchantment. He lay catching his breath on the riverbank in the shade of a birch tree. The sun shone brightly, and he somehow felt both sweaty and cold from his dunk. As he lay his head against the white and black dapple trunk, I had a pristine view of the result of the scuffle on his armor. Jason moaned. What was I thinking? He exclaimed. All the weeks he spent gathering materials, digging at places to sleep in, and fending off mobs. Why did I risk it all now? He wasn't afraid of being killed. He hadn't experienced it yet, but some of the more veteran players in his village said it was painless. They described it, saying it was like there's no place for them to go, that their only option was to come back. They couldn't even choose to not, so they were just let back into their bodies. They would wake up in their beds a few minutes later. No one knew why. Jason stopped his self-chastisement and took a closer look at the damage to his armor. It was heavily gouged, and marring his usually spotless diamond plate were grips of three evenly spaced dents. A chunk of armor right under his left armpit was ripped free, and the flesh still tingled where the stake had healed it. He sighed. It would take days at the forge to repair this. He pushed himself up and took off his armor, storing it in his inventory. Using his hand to block the bright sun, he tried to gauge which way he would need to travel. Digging through his inventory, he pulled out a compass, and spun around, looking for northeast. There. He started at a trot, and stopped to make his way up one of the tall hills in the spire. Jason reached the top of the hill, and surveyed the landscape before him. Peering out towards the northeast, he could make out the village where he lived, barely visible through the fog that usually obscured faraway scenery. It had been months since he had last seen this place. Before, he had barely left. But, once he had run out of resources, he had no other option but to go into the world and make his fortune. Now, three months later, he was filled to the brim with iron, coal, gold, and diamonds, even some quartz from the nether. He was more than excited to be back. Jason made his way more speedily down the hill, and up the next, then the next. Panting, he finally reached the smooth ground of the plains. Exhausted from his previous spurt, he was content with walking at a normal pace. The distance to the village was longer than I looked from the top of the hill, certainly almost a thousand blocks. He won't be able to make it before night as he had hoped. Reaching a good two-thirds of the way, Jason stopped beside a short, grassy hill. He wanted to keep going during the night, but once he remembered that he was armorless, the notion was banished. Even with a triant and a diamond sword, he couldn't do much against the range of skeletons and the brute force of zombies. Tunneling into the hill with his diamond shovel, Jason struck stone. He began excavating a small sleeping space, but the moan of an undead interrupted his digging. Turning around quickly, Jason barricaded off the top of his mineshaft with blocks, and then placed a torch just as quickly, illuminating the earth walls and stone floor. He placed his bed in the right-hand corner. It was just a white bed, crafted from scavenged wool. His bed at home was a deep, luscious purple, a color none too easy to obtain. Other players in his village were especially withdrawn individuals, but they all took pride in the exotic colors they could procure. With this bed down, Jason walked over to it, and sat down on it, rifling through his inventory. He found what he was looking for a pot and a cherry tree sapling. Placing down the small, cool clay pot, he brought out the sapling and set it carefully into it. Jason knew he had no reason for this. It was only a temporary shelter, but he also knew it made the dirt dug out homier. He put out the torch and lay on his bed in the darkness until his eyes closed in sleep. 
As the sun rose above the plains, Jason broke the barricade in front of his tunnel and stepped out into the crisp morning air. He already packed up his bed and dismantled his potted plant. With renewed energy, he started walking towards the village once again. In the still morning, Jason could hear the faint sounds of the newly risen villagers as they began their day. A sharp clang on an anvil signaled that the blacksmith was already at work, the dismay of those trying to sleep in. As the sun rose higher and illuminated the plains, the sounds of pigs and cows joined the mix. After making his way through a clump of trees, he reached the Tron path that led to the village. He could see the first house only a hundred blocks in front of him as he walked along the path. The village in its entirety was larger than most, and thus had attracted a fair amount of players. Six last time he checked. Homes and shops dawed the rolling hills and stretched even into the forest. Hundreds of villagers lived here, and trading was profitable as many wandering traders were coming through each week, ready to buy and sell goods from other villages. A nearby river fed the irrigation, and the crowds grew large in the pleasant sun. A few minutes later, he reached the back of the low building. Its walls were created of light pink clay, designating it as the residence of a mason. The colors were similar to others Jason had seen in the mesa. Thinking back, he tried to remember who this house could belong to. With a pang of sudden sadness, he remembered the kindly face of Mason, ironically the Mason, who had perished in the most recent raid, nine months ago. Jason realized with an opposite, equally powerful pang of shame that he hadn't thought about this man for months. Hadn't they once been close? Hadn't Jason receded into his house for weeks after losing his mentor and friend? The wise words of Mason had even started Jason's journey. Staying in safety allows lethargy, coming into danger allows adventure. And Drayson trusted him on that. He knew that in the villager's youth, he had battled some of the fiercest foes on his journeys. With his skeletons and strays, even guardians. In some villages, he was even semi-famous for being the only villager in the entire northern plains to vanquish an elder guardian. Usually, only players risked it. Villagers could die by wounds or starvation like any other mob. As Jason sat reminiscing, his back against the cool clay, he was disturbed by a voice hailing him. Jason, Jason! A young villager in his teens rushed up the path towards him, a large grin on his face. Jason smiled and propped himself up. It was Barney, one of the farmer's apprentices. In his time not taken up by work, Jason had been giving Barney some free sword lessons. The young apprentice was certainly not naturally gifted, but he was determined. Barney reached Jason and gave him an awkward, short hug, grinning broadly. Jason didn't like physical touch much, but he suffered it. You're back. Did you beat the wither? Perhaps take a piglin's hoard of gold? Barney rubbed his hands together, his eyes glistening with the thoughts of adventure. Sometimes Jason wished Barney was able to go out and maybe accomplish some of the things he dreamed about. But villager heroes like Mason were few and far between for a reason. Although a villager learning to wield a sword was not frowned upon, it was rare. I've indeed returned, Apprentice, though perhaps with not such great tales. I did slay some oars quite viciously though, and raided the horde of an abandoned outpost. Jason indicated to the large, barely used crossbow peeking out of a satchel, which he had set upon nearby stone. Barney's eyes opened wide as he opened the sack and gazed at the diamonds, gold, iron, and emeralds peeking out. Surely this is more than enough to buy this entire village, Swordmaster. Barney liked to use Swordmaster to refer to Jason, as it reflected the term used by apprentices when they formally studied swordsmanship. In turn, Jason referred to Barney as Apprentice. How is there this much ore in an even entire buy -in? Barney exclaimed, raking through the inventory with his fingers. Jason chuckled. There isn't nearly as much as you think, Apprentice. I could barely afford a forge, if I wanted one, let alone a whole village. It took a long time and effort, but riches are not so hard to come by if you work for it. Here, Jason employed another of Mason's teachings. Barney replaced the flap on the satchel and handed it back to Jason. The young man looked about ready to rush out of the village and begin a journey of his own. Quickly, Jason pulled an iron sword out of his inventory and handed it hilt first to Barney, who took it, surprised. Let's see how well your swordmanship fared while I was away. Did you practice like you were instructed, or did you let it relax? From the look on the apprentice's face, Jason could tell it was the second option. Donning his bright blue barred armor, Jason saw Barney's eyes glance at the damage on it, a question in his eyes. Tell you later, Jason promised. Barney took a pair of iron armor from his smaller inventory and put it on, readying his sword and warming up with some of the stances he had been taught. Jason pulled another iron sword from his inventory and stood waiting. Barney signaled he was ready, and they both launched into the practice whirls, blocks, feints, stabs, and swipes. This was just a practice. They wouldn't put much force behind their swings, and they were wearing armor, so no one would be in actual danger. As they fought, villagers began to trickle and to watch. They cheered and groaned at an appreciable swing or an ill-timed stumble. Their attention wrapped. Barney was better than he was, Jason had to admit it. He was steady on his feet, barely losing ground and sure with his swings. This time, he rarely accidentally struck with the flat of the blade, or unconsciously shuffled his feet, as he had been known to do before. 
After the mock-up duel, Jason congratulated his apprentice. We'll make it swordsman of you yet, Barney, he said smiling. Barney only smiled back, breathing hard with sweat dripping down his face. He stowed his gear and quickly made his way back to the cows before he got in trouble with his father. The small crowd of 15 or 20 villagers slowly dispersed, leaving to continue their duties, commenting on or congratulating Jason and Barney's showing. One of the last to leave was the librarian, Thomas. Just the villager Jason wanted to see. He, if any, would know about the trine. Jason took the long prismarine trine out of his inventory, the enchantment casting purple glimmers all over his armor, and strode towards the librarian. The old villager smiled at him as he approached. Then he stared, jaw slightly agape. Wonder of wonders, Thomas exclaimed. It's been so long since I've seen one of these, not held in the hand of a faraway king or secured by the undead. Jason had reached the librarian's side, and he handed over the trident to the eager librarian. The elderly villager peered at it, eyes squinted. He seemed twenty years younger. Suddenly, Thomas pointed out a spot on one of the sides right beneath where the prongs began. He and Jason both peered closely. A cluster of symbols unknown to Jason lay there unnoticed. As he looked closer, it seemed to him that the enchantment gloom itself emanated from them. He glanced up and met Thomas' eyes. The librarian smiled excitedly. This I have never seen, he said, beckoning for Jason to follow him as he rushed off to his library. The end, or is it? Part three, maybe? This is the outro where I thank you guys for listening. You, my listeners. Also, I usually tell you to go do the stuff I already said to do inside the intro, but why repeat myself, you know? Anyways, next episode will be out uh, sometime. I don't know. I don't think it'll be released next week because Thanksgiving and stuff. Maybe. I don't know. Keep your eyes peeled for some episodes, and I'll see you in the next one.